Hello and welcome to another episode of Career Chat. I am your host, Shannon Crooks, and I am a librarian three at the Hillcrest Heights branch of the Prince George's County Memorial Library System. On today's show, we have Jordan Madison. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist, and she's going to be telling us about her career today. And please remember that each and every Wednesday at three o'clock, you can join us for a new and exciting career. We hope these careers motivate you and encourage you um, to seek new opportunities. Okay, so Jordan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. Um, the first question is, what is a licensed marriage and family therapist and what are your job responsibilities and duties? So a licensed, I'm a licensed clinical marriage and family therapist in the state of Maryland. Okay. And so that means I am licensed and able to see individuals, couples, and families as well. Mm -hmm. I, that means I'm a therapist. It's very similar to LCPCs, which are licensed clinical professional counselors. Um, but the one difference with LMFTs is that we are specifically trained to work with couples and families. And we also, even when working with individuals, we look at them from like an in, like a, a systemic lens. So even if I just have an individual client, I'm looking at how do your family members or the systems that you're a part of impact who you are or the patterns and things that you've seen growing up, how does that impact your day-to-day -day functioning? So that's what I do, that's the definition. My job responsibilities include seeing I see about 20-ish clients a week, mm -hmm. um, all virtual for right now. And so my job responsibilities include seeing those clients, writing case notes on those clients and making sure that I document that they've been seen. Um, that takes up a lot of time as well. Mm -hmm. Of course, in between sessions, I'm also researching or Googling just different things that I can do or try with my clients in session. Um, what else am I in charge of? For the practice that I work for, I also do a little bit of admin work that's not typical in the um, in the position per se, but I don't mind helping. So that's what I've been doing on the side as well. And so that's kind of my, my day to day looks like, you know, just seeing, I see about maybe five or six clients a day mm -hmm. and then start my notes and try to fill those. I try to do all my notes for the day. Sometimes that works, sometimes I get behind, but um, I try to make sure that everything is done by the end of the week. Mm -hmm. And when you say notes, you mean notes on the, the discussion you have with the clients during mm -hmm. their sessions? Okay. Yeah. All right, so are those lengthy notes or? Um, they don't have to be per se. Mine sometimes end up being a little lengthy because I try to make sure I capture most of what we say, but also for like client confidentiality, I don't give like explicit details of what we talk about. Um, I really just try to note like themes or things that I notice, but I don't go into too long of a detail. So on a good day, if I'm really focused, it really should only take me like 10 minutes to do one. Okay. All right. Yeah, some people are concerned about that. I know some people don't want to go to therapy because they, you know, think everything's being recorded or documented. Mm -hmm. um, so for anyone watching, um, thinking about pursuing therapy, just know that, yes, there is client confidentiality involved um, when you meet with your therapist. Uh, very important. Um, so the next question, Jordan, is how long have you been working in this industry? Um, it has been about three years for me. I went to college and received my bachelor's in psychology. Mm -hmm. And then I went straight from undergrad into graduate school and got my master's in couple and family therapy. Mm -hmm. And even while getting my master's, well, if I count my time in my master's, I would say it's been about five years then. Because even during my master's, I had clinical experience. I had to see clients. We needed 400 client contact hours to graduate. Mm -hmm. So that was seeing a lot of clients in a year and a half. Mm -hmm. um, and then after graduating, I began working at the private practice that I'm at now mm -hmm. and seeing clients there since August-ish of 2018. So 
in total, it's been about five years. Okay. And so, you know, as a former social worker, a lot of people don't understand what, you know, the license means, but can you explain to people what it means to get a license, what that process looks like? I do believe the process has changed since I've gotten mine, but I'll at least share like what I did. Okay. Um, so first, right after graduating or even right before graduating, actually, I applied to be a licensed graduate marriage and family therapist. Mm -hmm. And so what that means <clears throat> is that I would be licensed or able to see clients, but I also need supervision. So I need to talk to another fully licensed marriage and family therapist about my cases, about what's going on. And to become fully licensed in the state of Maryland, at least, I needed 100 hours of supervision mm -hmm. and I needed 1,000 hours of direct contact with clients. Mm -hmm. So I have, you have two years to get those two um, numbers, basically. Mm -hmm. So now that I'm fully licensed, now I don't necessarily need supervision. Like I'm able to see clients without getting supervised. I still go to supervision and I still get supervised just because um, I like to make sure that, you know, I'm talking to someone else about what's going on or what I'm noticing in my clients or what I can do to be a better therapist. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically I'm not necessarily required to get licensed. Or, I'm sorry. I'm not necessarily required to have supervision now that I'm fully licensed. Oh, okay. I can do a little more. Like I can work for myself. Well, technically, I guess you can work for yourself, even if you aren't fully licensed, you just still need the supervision. Mm -hmm. um, but being fully licensed does open up a little bit more options. Mm -hmm. So do you have to take a test to get fully licensed? So I had to take a test to get my LG MFT. So basically I graduated from my master's program right before graduating. I took the marriage and family therapy or the national like marriage and family therapy exam. Mm -hmm. And then after I received, I had to pay for that because that was like 300 or so. It was, I don't know, it was a wow, it's expensive. It was something dollars. Um, and then you also have to pay like another 300 and something to apply to be a licensed graduate marriage and family therapist. So it was very expensive at the time. Um, so I took that exam after passing that exam. And, and I want to say you find out that you passed no, never mind. That's the other one. Okay. So after passing that exam or finding out that I passed that exam, then I, you get a letter from the board saying that I'm able to take the Maryland jurisprudence exam. So that's basically like the laws and just, you know, ethical things and reporting stuff and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think you had to pay 150 to take that, I think. Okay. Uh, so after I took those two exams, and I had already sent in my application to apply, then I was fully, well, I was licensed as a graduate marriage and family therapist, and I could begin seeing clients in my work setting. Oh, okay. So then two years of seeing clients in my work setting, when it came time to apply to for full licensure, I didn't have to take any other exams, mm -hmm. but I did have to document that I've passed. I did have to document you know, a transcript, um, mm -hmm. my hours, the people, not the people that I've seen, but the um, number of, of hours that I've like seen with clients. And then I had to have supervisors sign off on my work and send all that in. And that you had to send in and pay, I think another three, 300 something. Mm -hmm. And then once they say like, okay, it's approved, then you have to pay another 150. I don't remember, I don't know why they split wow. it. But <laughs> expensive. Yeah, yeah. So it was expensive. I mean, fortunately, it's kind of like spaced out. Yeah. Bit, so it wasn't like I had to do all of that at once. The expensive thing for me, at least, was paying for supervision because mm -hmm. where I work, there are licensed clinical professional counselors and they can give me supervision, but they're not marriage and family therapists. So I had to hire or not well yeah hire basically a marriage and family therapist supervisor and pay for those for our supervision sessions so mm -hmm. that was expensive mm -hmm. 
But if you want to be a marriage and family therapist and you're working under a marriage and family therapist, then typically you would get supervision with that job. So that part may not be expensive for everyone else. Mm. Yeah, as a social worker, it's a little bit different. You do the, you get the graduate license, you take the test to get the graduate license, you pay, I think it's two something or close to two something. And then once you get that license, you have to be supervised by somebody who has the clinical social worker license for two years. Then you sit for the clinical exam, you get to pay for that. And then you get the clinical, but you also has, have to accumulate that client contact hours, supervision hours, all those things have to be documented. Um, but it's not quite as expensive as the one that you have. That's a lot more uh, well, steps, yeah. And yeah, it's it seems like you all have to take two tests or is it that you take two, you take an exam after the LMSW? Yeah, the, some states call it the LM, some states call it the LGSW. Okay. I think, now, I think they've all adopted the LGSW now, okay. but when you get the LG, that's straight out of graduate school, you can take that one. Then you have to, you know, be in practice for two years, get your supervision hours, get your client contact hours. I think even group supervision is included. And then you sit for the clinical exam. And then once you pass that, you become a clinical social worker. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then yeah. I, even in Maryland to supervise, you have to go through a whole nother process, I think, to be able to be eligible to supervise. So just because you have the clinical doesn't mean you can supervise someone mm -hmm. you know, trying to get the clinical. So it's yeah, because I've been thinking of becoming a supervisor as well, just to help other people and for like another source of income. But I, I'm like, okay, I don't have the mental capacity right now to figure out what I need to do. Like there's certain steps you'd have to take. And yeah, I just, um, I haven't done my research at least mm -hmm. to do that part yet. But I think also because I just got fully licensed in July of last year, mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm even eligible immediately to become a supervisor. Oh, okay. Wow. But I have to look into that. I just haven't because I've been, my mind has been all over the place with other stuff. So. Okay. Yeah, Maryland to me is one of the stricter states when it comes to licensure. Like some of the other states don't require quite as much, but yeah, Maryland is very particular, which is good in a way, you know. They yeah. Sure. <laughs> People I mean, are me, it felt easier to go through Maryland um, because I, I'm originally from New York and I was thinking of getting licensed. Oh yeah, they're hard too. <laughs> that process seemed so difficult and I was like, I'm going to just stick to Maryland because I already know how that process works. Mm -hmm. um, I did recently like, I'm trying to get licensed in DC. Mm -hmm. so that would at least help me see more people as well. Um, mm -hmm. And DC, I've heard if you're already licensed in Maryland, then it's much easier, but I haven't heard anything back yet. So okay. this call has reminded me that I need to email them. <laughs> <laughs> and viewers, you know, for the licensing process, if you choose to become, you know, a therapist, a marriage and family therapist, you have to get licensed in the state that you want to practice in. So that's so important, no matter what school you go to. Let's say you live here in D.C. and you go to a school in D.C. and you want to move to California, you're probably going to have to take the California exam or it makes more sense to take it. Or you could take the D.C. exam, but you have to follow whatever rules California has in set to get reciprocity, meaning to get your license transferred over to California or wherever you're going to move to. So it's a process. Um, and I wish I had known more about it before I went to school to be a social worker, but unfortunately I didn't. I had to learn along the way. So hopefully yeah, we'll they, don't, somebody. they don't warn you necessarily. Like if I wanted to move to Georgia, then I would need to get licensed in Georgia. I could still see my clients in Maryland because I am licensed in Maryland, mm -hmm. but your clients need to be wherever you're licensed. And I think right now, especially because of COVID, people are expecting like, oh, everything's virtual. It doesn't matter who I see. Mm -hmm. But it does, like, you still need to, whoever I'm seeing needs to be a resident of Maryland. Mm -hmm. Yes, very true. And here it's a little tricky because like when I was a social worker in DC, I saw clients 
in Maryland. So I had to carry both licenses at the same time, DC and Maryland. Even though Maryland and DC are so close to each other, you mm -hmm. still have to have those licenses. So yes, thank you for pointing that out. So important. Um, I've talked to a couple of therapists and social workers on this show, but we didn't get into the licensing part. And at the end, they were like, oh, we didn't get into what it means to go through the licensing process. So I was like, let me make sure when yeah. I meet with Jordan, I go through it because that's so important. That's like, you know, you, you can't really practice without those licenses. So yeah. I'm glad we discussed that. Um, so how did you get interested in this profession, Jordan? Um, so I knew I wanted to be a therapist since maybe like eighth grade or so, like pretty young, like 13 or 14. I was watching an episode of Grey's Anatomy with my mom and um, the main character was in a therapy session. And I just remember really liking how the therapist in that session helped her have like an aha moment. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I want to be able to help people understand things about themselves, talk with them through their problems. But I didn't know what type of therapist I wanted to be until maybe my junior year um, of college. So I went to Spelman in Atlanta mm -hmm. and we had a lot of education and curriculum about just like being black women and, and the intersectionality of like how your race and your gender intersect and create different experiences. And being surrounded by so many people that looked like me, it was also really obvious that like mental health was stigmatized and that we're not talking about it as much. Mm -hmm. So while on campus, I was president of this club on campus that was basically aimed at reducing mental health stigma. And mm -hmm. so that position that made me realize like I definitely want to help and serve the black community and make sure that people are talking about their problems and not feeling like it's so taboo, like we all go through different things and it's okay. Mm -hmm. And then when it came to like couple and family therapy in particular, one, I just always liked being the friend that everyone came to with like their relationship problems and like hearing, you know, what they had going on and offering advice. Mm -hmm. But the other piece was Michael Brown was murdered the summer right before my junior year. Mm -hmm. And I remember like being really impacted by that and doing walks and protests and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And while I enjoyed doing that, I realized like, okay, this is good, but this is probably not like, I'm not gonna be like a protester every single time or day to day. Like that just might not be my ministry, but how can I help the black community heal from stuff that we're constantly going through? And it just made me think if I took his murder so hard, like imagine his family and his friends and like, what do you do Mm -hmm. when an integral part of your family like is lost like how do you repair um so that's kind of what led me into the couple and family therapy field mm. yeah it's so interesting that you say that every time I see you know something like that happen um it's played so many times like on you know the news and then if you're on social media it's like you can't escape seeing it um, and it does cause PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder for people who may not necessarily be a family member of the person who yeah. got harmed, but seeing that can trigger um, emotions inside of you that you never knew you had, or, you know, seeing a police officer can trigger you, or, you know, seeing someone being attacked by someone, it's just these constant triggers that people don't realize are causing you to have you know symptoms of anxiety or depression or fear you know so I'm so glad that you addressed that because that's huge right now for the black community yeah that's I mean, my thesis was on just like how interactions with the police are impacting black women because I don't know anyone personally who has been harmed by the police and I haven't but I still feel anxious if I see a police officer or if I see someone like pull someone over I'll like look out the window and make sure they're okay. Like there's certain things that I'll do because I've seen these things happen. And I don't, I don't watch the videos of what happens. I used to like at least watch the beginning or get really invested in like research, like what happened, mm -hmm. but I could never watch the actual footage of like a life being taken. Cause mm -hmm. that just is, I can't do that. Um, but even, even not watching it just cause you know 
what happens is really hurtful because then it, it's I knew for me that it was starting to impact me more than I realized when I started seeing like oh that could have easily been a family member of mine like I remember an example of like when Philando Castile was killed and it was like oh well, he was licensed to carry he had a weapon but he was following instructions he said like hey I'm licensed to carry and like let them know and I remember thinking like oh like my uncle is licensed to carry like what what if that happened to him? So once I started thinking like, oh, these situations could really happen to someone I know, mm -hmm. it was like really anxiety inducing. So that's what made me think if this is impacting me, of course, this is impacting other people that look like me. And that made me want to do my thesis on that topic. Wow. Well, I'm so um, happy that you're pursuing uh, mental health in this way, because there are so many people, like you said, in the Black community who feel like you know, if you go see a therapist, you're crazy. Or, you know, if you engage in any type of mental health services, something's wrong with you. But the fact of the matter is mental health is a part of health. You know, it's a part of making sure that you can function, you know, in the world. And some of us need it, you know, and I'm so glad that you're trying to tackle that, that stigma and bring, you know, that facade down because, so many people need help and they're not getting it. And when this um, episode airs, it will be Mental Health Awareness Month in May. So nice. this is an appropriate uh, career chat to have during that month. So yes. Um, what obstacles did you face um, during the pursuit of your profession? Um, grad school was just rough <laughs> um, in general. <laughs> But I'll say it wasn't rough academically, it was rough time-wise, like trying to manage classes and clients and an assistantship. I really felt like I just had no time mm -hmm. to do much else. After graduating, the difficulty really became like just getting enough hours for licensure. Mm -hmm. I remember like I have journal entries of me like freaking out in February of 2020, like my license expires, my LG expires in July. How am I going to get my, my hours in time? I need supervision, like just freaking out because I did not know how I was going to do it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have enough, I definitely didn't have enough supervision hours. I wasn't super worried about like my direct contact hours. Mm -hmm. But even then at that time, I wasn't seeing that many clients. And honestly, COVID ended up being helpful in the sense that I got a lot of clients and more people because everyone's home everything's virtual people are not canceling sessions or people are not having to drive in they're like you know just hopping on their phone and so even though COVID has been like really negative um I will say that that ended up being helpful in my career piece at least at that time because it helped me get the hours that I needed because I was really really stressed and feeling like I was not about to have enough hours and do what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and then supervision wise, I ended up just having to hire like two supervisors so I can get, I just had multiple supervision each week mm -hmm. to get the hours that I needed. And that cost more money, but I was like, at this point, I don't care because had I not gotten my hours, I would have had to, um, apply for what do they call it like an extension mm -hmm. but I still would have had to pay like wow a about the same amount oh my goodness and so I was like I don't want to pay the money to file for an extension and then like two months later have my hours like because I was so close so mm -hmm. that was another reason why I was like I don't mind paying the money I mean i I worked out like payment plans with my supervisors and I just did that way because mm -hmm. I, I refused to pay like $300 to, to renew or to extend just to then a few months later, pay another 300 to fully get licensed. Mm. Wow. So I know a lot of people who are in the mental health profession um, deal with burnout and viewers, what burnout is, is when you've been working so much with so many clients, you start to feel stress, you know, sometimes it can affect your mental health and then you might feel like you don't want to do it anymore. So have you faced that since you've been in the profession? Um, I don't know if it's ever gotten to the 
place of, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's ever gotten that far. There are times when I do feel like exhausted or just like, this is a long week. I only see clients Mondays through Thursdays. Mm -hmm. That does give me Friday, Saturday, and Sunday free. Mm -hmm. But lately, honestly, it doesn't even feel like that's been enough time because on Fridays, since I'm not seeing clients, that's when I schedule like a whole bunch of other meetings or I do other stuff that I need to do. Mm -hmm. Um, So Friday still feels sometimes like work and Saturday and Sunday, I don't know, just the weekend doesn't seem long enough. Um, But I do (laughs) try to really implement self-care and make sure that I am pouring into myself. Mm -hmm. So I I talk a lot, especially like on my Instagram page about like self-care and how to take care of yourself. And so I was, I haven't done this in a while, so I've been behind, but I was making like self-care Saturday videos and just showing people what I do for Mm -hmm. self-care because I try to make sure that I'm practicing what I preach. Mm -hmm. And that's been helpful. So some examples would be like doing yoga or after I'm done seeing clients, maybe I'll put my phone on do not disturb if I don't feel like talking to other people for the day or I like candles, I have plants. Um, Mm -hmm. I've recently, now that I just got the first vaccine, I've been going back to my um, apartment gym Mm -hmm. and trying to work out more because that was not consistent at all. Um, Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to do that. So I just, I try to find ways and time to still pour into myself and not feel like everything is work. Mm -hmm. Some days I think it's still easier than others. Like yesterday, actually a few clients rescheduled. So I only saw three clients and I was like, oh, this is great. Mm -hmm. Um, But on other days I see like seven clients and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a lot. And Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk to anyone after the end of the day. So it's really just about like scheduling time to make sure that I'm not burning out and that I am pouring into myself so that I can then pour into my clients. Wow. Yeah. You, you have it down pat. I didn't have it down pat. This is so short. Well, I will say though, social work to me also seems much more emotionally taxing and draining because like we talked a bit about like you're dealing with the, um, adoption families or like foster care system and like working with kids I don't see kids I really mainly see adults Mm -hmm. or couples um and a lot of the adults that I see it's more like relationship distress and like trying to figure out what to do next so their issues are still real issues and they're still important but they they don't feel as emotionally draining to me like after I see the client, after I'm very present in the moment, I help them feel better, but I don't take it home with me or after yeah. session, I'm still thinking about them. Mm-hmm. Some clients I'm like, oh, I hope they're okay. Cause that was a lot. But mm-hmm. most of the times I'm not doing that on a daily basis. Whereas mm-hmm. if I were in social work or if I was seeing young kids just, you know, in the system or not being treated right or their parents, didn't, they, I'm sure that would weigh on me more. Mm-hmm. So I definitely think the field or the clientele that you see also depends on your burnout as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wish I had known about marriage and um, family therapy. I probably would have went for a master's in that instead, but I didn't know at this time. I only knew about social work Mm -hmm. um, or the other, you know, counselors. I probably would have considered those because some people, they, they can do it. You know, they go, they see their clients as a social worker. They can turn it on and off at any given moment, but there's some people who cannot turn it off. And when they go home, they're constantly thinking about, okay, what do I do with this case? Okay. Why did this go wrong? Like constantly. And that's not good. You have to be able to turn it off, yeah. you know, and they don't really teach that in graduate school, how to turn it off. They just say, okay, here's your set of skills on how to work with people. Okay. Go conquer the world when you yeah. get out of school. I'll say grad school doesn't teach at least it, I remember like being told that it's important that we take care of ourselves, mm-hmm. but they didn't actually give us time to do that. And they don't teach ways. We did have, cause I do remember like having books on like self-care for therapists. Mm-hmm. So I do remember that. And I think they tried, mm-hmm. but it just wasn't as pr- like a practical, like this is what you can do to take care of yourself. So for me, grad school doesn't necessarily teach the self-care aspect and it doesn't teach the business aspect. Mm -hmm. Like if I want to start my practice, 
I don't know what I'm doing. You know, like it doesn't teach certain things. You have to learn that from experience as well. So I wish that grad school not only taught us how to be clinicians, but also how to work for ourselves or how to like, what are things that we needed? Like, I didn't know I needed a, a NPI number. I can't remember what that stands for right now, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, or there's just certain things that like being credentialed with insurance or like there's certain things that we just don't learn in grad school. So I wish that I did have that knowledge. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. A lot of my friends who started their own private practice as clinical social workers said the same thing. They didn't know where to start, who to turn to. So they try to join various groups. Like I know on um, Facebook, there's the Black Therapist Rock group that are a lot of my friends are part of. I'm also in the same group. And I see post after post of people saying, oh, I don't know how to start my private practice. Oh, where do I start? Oh, what do you do? How do you do this? And I'm just like, wow, we really didn't learn how to, you know, take our career to the next level. We just learned the basics and we had to figure out the rest on our own. And sometimes that's not good because you're dealing, like you said, with insurance companies. And then if someone, God forbid, is suicidal, they may come to you as a therapist to, for your contact notes. So when we were talking about notes earlier, you know, you have to kind of be careful about what you put in your notes um, because you never know, you know, what could happen. You could be subpoenaed to come to court, all these things. I just don't feel like grad school has prepared people for when they get out into the field. Right. I completely agree. Like that is not talked about. We do have an ethics course. Yeah, we had ethics. But I also feel like ethics have changed. Now social media is huge. There's so many therapists who are on social media now, like myself included. Does that mean, so if a client of mine follows me, even though I will say I have like a separate, my personal page versus my therapy page, right? So clients don't follow or know my personal page, but d does that mean that like they can follow me on social media? Does, is that a dual relationship? Like there's so many things that have also been changing in our profession. And now with telehealth, like I know, I think Maryland just passed a bill for licensed professional counselors where they can, they're a part of the, I forget what they called it. Um, the collect, I, sorry, I'm going to get the name wrong, but basically um, professional counselors in Maryland can join this pact and basically they're, they have reciprocity in um, whatever states are a part of the pact. Mm -hmm. Amazing. But there's differences because LP, LPCs versus social workers versus marriage and family therapists are all doing different things. And even though I want to say we're all licensed under the same board, mm -hmm. um, yeah. there's different rules mm -hmm. and it's, it's frustrating. There's, there's so much, you know, that I don't necessarily feel like grad school does like prepare you for. So you have to learn on your own. And the other thing I forgot to mention is the importance of getting continuing education credit so you oh, need yeah. to use mm -hmm. so I'm fully licensed awesome I was like Whew, okay wait off my back <laughs> now it's like no I have to keep going to conferences and keep um paying for CEU credits mm -hmm. so that I can have my continuing education and re not reapply but what's the word I'm looking for re basically just like recertify that I'm yeah, recertify. You know, licensed, mm -hmm. you know, so, and you have to do that like every two years. Yep. So thing for social work and pay money again. <laughs> exactly. And it's just, it's, it's crazy. So um, that's the hard piece that I think is not talked about. And that's why it's also important that we do talk about, like, we need to know how to be a business for ourselves, how to set our prices, how to, I think, because we feel really guilt, at least, for me, I would feel really guilty having high prices, mm -hmm. but also to maintain my profession, I need large, well, not large, but yeah, I need <laughs> money to do so, right? And so yep. there are certain things that are just not taught in grad school that I think would be really appreciated. Mm -hmm. Because with the private practice, you have to pay for the rental of the space. You have to pay for, you know, if you have other people hired to work for you, you have to pay for, you know, heating, air conditioning, lighting. So all those things, you know, yep. there's a fee for it. And, you know, yeah, 
40 50 dollars an hour you know for somebody paying for the therapy might be reasonable for them but it might not be reasonable for you to accept that knowing that you have to pay for all these other things um so yeah they they do not teach anything about that so that's that's not good um but yeah if you're going into this profession um, and you're watching this, please understand that there's going to be a lot of things you're going to have to, you know, learn on your own, or, you know, maybe you can get a really good mentor, someone who has been in the field for several years, and they're willing to coach you and mentor you on what you need to do as far as navigating this profession. But there's a lot of ins and outs that are not taught in graduate school for yeah. this particular profession. Yeah. And I mean, I will say it's still to me a rewarding profession. I'm still not like regretting it. I'm, I wish that we, I had learned these things in grad school, but I do have people in my life or people that know people like, you know, there's definitely a community of therapists. Like you mentioned, like there's Facebook groups, there's stuff where you can ask questions and people talk to you about certain things. And I will say this field for me, doesn't feel like super, super competitive. I mean, and there's a lot of private practices in the mm -hmm. world, um, but I think to me, I haven't really experienced people like, oh, I can't tell you this, or I can't tell you that, because that'll mean this. Like everyone's looking at it like, clients are gonna choose who they want to work with. So there's no need for competition or messy or like really petty things. It's mm -hmm. we help each other. So that's been helpful. Um, I feel like there was one more thing I was going to say, but I forgot it. But it it has been rewarding for the most part. And I know since COVID, it seems like a lot of people may be switching to keeping virtual therapy, mm -hmm. right? And so if you are interested in this field, then that is a pro of like setting your own hours and working from home. So you can choose when you, if you work for yourself, you can really, if you work for yourself or some private practices, you should still be able to choose like your own hours and set when you want to work. Um, mm -hmm. so that's helpful. I do appreciate the flexibility of it. And mm -hmm. I especially ap appreciate the flexibility of being virtual right now, just because I have like family in New York. So sometimes I'll like go home and I'll still be able to see clients or, um, you know, stuff like that. So there's definitely still some pros. Mm -hmm. yeah, there are a lot, a lot of pros. And yeah. then another thing is that we need more African-American therapists. Like when I um, really started doing my research, there's not a lot of us, especially in rural areas. Um, you know, I, in that same Facebook group, I'll see a lot of people say, okay, do you know a therapist in this particular area? And I'll say, hmm, I don't, you know, and that's not good. Um, and I know that it's, you know, it doesn't matter if you see a white therapist or a black therapist, but for some African-American people, it's easier for them to see another African-American therapist because they understand some of the things that they face, you know, in life just because of the way the world is set up. Um, so yeah, I mean, in even just simple things like I have clients, I had a, one client, this is a while back, but like one who was transitioning with her hair and I already knew what that meant because I've gone through that. Like there's just little small nuances that you understand when you're speaking with someone who looks like you that you don't have to go through and explain and that doesn't mean that all black people have the exact same experience so you don't have to like there's still going to be situations with my clients where I ask like what does that mean or maybe there's a difference between like Caribbean culture and African culture and African American culture and all of those things but mm -hmm. a lot of times there is a shared understanding that is helpful and that makes clients feel more comfortable mm -hmm. Yes, so there is a need. So hopefully, if you're interested in being a therapist, um, you can look into trying to, um, you know, get some experience in working with someone who is a therapist or maybe start off slow. I know a lot of people who may have worked at a group home and then they worked their way up to being a social worker just to see if they liked the profession. So I know we're talking about being a licensed therapist or a licensed social worker, but you can start off small. You can be a community support worker where you do work with clients, but you're not necessarily responsible for them. And so that would give you some experience to see what it's like to work with 
um, somebody that would be a potential client. So if you're interested, there's room for you, even if you just have a high school diploma or a bachelor's degree. So don't feel like I can't get into this field because I don't have a master's degree. It's, it's simply not that way. There's different things you can do to be in the field. Yeah, so uh, the next question is, what advice do you have for someone wanting to do what you do? Um, really, I would kind of say, one, make sure that you are taking care of yourself. This is definitely a difficult field, or it can be, depending on the clients that you see, and you have to practice what you preach, um, taking care of yourself self-care-wise, but also in your relationships, and setting healthy boundaries, and doing those things so that you know what your clients are going through, and you can not necessarily give advice because it's not necessarily the therapist's job to give advice or tell clients what to do. It's our job to help the clients figure out what they want to do and just restate their, their opinions or their thoughts out loud so they can hear it and just help them process, right? So you're not in charge of like telling your client, this is what you should do. But the more that you are able to be healed and process your traumas and process emotions or experiences that you have, the, the better you're able to also realize how you're showing up in session and you know because as therapists we ourselves are the tools like doctors use scalpels we use ourselves so you have to make sure that you're in a good place and 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 this isn't to say that as a therapist you have to be perfect <laughs> not not saying that at all um but just being aware of your shortcomings or how you your triggers or how you cope with certain things mm -hmm. so i would say that's really important um any other advice i would say really just go for it. Like a lot of times we have these ideas of, I have to be at this level to be taken seriously. But a lot of times people just need someone to talk to an objective person to just hear what they're going through. Mm -hmm. so, you know, give yourself more credit that you are probably more capable than you think. Mm -hmm. And really just don't give up. There are moments or it sounds really difficult, but honestly the process to me seemed much shorter than I expected. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's because growing up, I thought you had to like have a PhD to be a therapist. So I thought I'd have to like <laughs> do all this extra stuff. And now when I realized like, no, I can go get my master's in two years and then get fully licensed in another two, it was like, oh, okay. Like that's really not that bad. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would say those are kind of my, my tidbits of advice. Yeah, I like that you said, um, you know, being aware of your your own emotions and your own self. So when you show up for someone else in therapy, you're able to help them and be more authentic. Um, mm -hmm. That's so important. I know a lot of people who are therapists or social workers, they have a therapist that they personally go see for themselves mm -hmm. because that's part of their self-care. Not that, you know, they have a mental health diagnosis. Some do, some don't but it just means that they have someone that they can then process their feelings about stuff too, because they're human. You know, if you hear traumatic experiences over and over and over as a therapist, it's gonna take an effect on you. And, you know, it's okay to go and talk to someone and say, hey, when I had a session with someone, this really affected me or this triggered me, you know, so that you too can have your time and space to process um, the situation so that when you show up the next time, you can still be um, that person that's able to listen, hear, and process with the client because they deserve that, you know. Um, so uh, the next question is, what about young people that are in high school? What do you think they should do as far as acquiring skills to be able to be a therapist? In high school, I would suggest maybe like kind of what you were saying, like volunteering. Um, I don't think in at high school you can like do a hotline or anything like that. I think that might be too young, mm -hmm. but just volunteering in different ways in your community, uh, maybe through church, maybe because church is a place where people may receive like pastoral guidance or counseling or stuff like that. So seeing if there's any ministries in your church where you can be helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, preparing for or thinking about maybe majoring in or choosing a college um, that has psychology or sociology or 
um, really, I mean, you can kind of major in anything that you want, but psychology, sociology, family sciences, mm -hmm. those seem to be like the, the majors that would best help you be suited for this work. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I said volunteering, maybe if you like, cause maybe you can't, unfortunately, like this is a profession where you do need a degree to, you know, work and see clients directly, but maybe you can be a receptionist in a mental health office or mm -hmm. get some mentors. Um, I wanna say for me, I grew up in New York and maybe my, I think I was in college when I did it, but I probably could have done it in high school too. Like I just started Googling therapists around me that mm -hmm. I could be talked to or, you know, that they could be mentors, not for me to see them as a therapist, but you know, just that. Also starting your own therapy might also be a good idea because I know when I was in grad school, we were like, you know, another way to learn how to be a therapist is to have one and to be on the couch and understand like what your clients are going through. So mm -hmm. I think that would be helpful as well. Mm -hmm. And then I know when you're, there's a difference between being a clinician and going to therapy versus not being a clinician and going to therapy. Because when you go and you tell them, you know, who you are and they say, oh, you know, then they might, you know, talk to you more and say, okay, you remember studying this in school. Um, what do you think about this for you? Because you know, you have a background on what's what with regard to treatment, um, you can have more of a conversation with them versus mm -hmm. you just coming in and they're trying to figure out what would work. You have a knowledge, a background knowledge of what's what as far as interventions um, and treatment. And so you can kind of talk with them through um, the different avenues that might work for you. Or, you know, if you're seeing clients, sometimes, you know, you can tell them what you've, you know, done with other clients. No, they won't necessarily tell you what's right and what's wrong, but they can talk with you, talk you through it, you know? So you can kind of have someone there um, as a, you know, a person who understands what you're going through to support you because, you know, being a, in this type of field, going to talk to your family members, your spouse, they don't understand um, because they're not in it on a day-to-day -day basis. You're dealing with people's emotions, feelings, thoughts, um, and then you're coming home and you're trying to process those with someone who doesn't have any understanding of mental health. It's very mm -hmm. difficult and challenging if that's, you know, who you're trying to rely on. So I wouldn't advise that you try to rely on those people to support you in that way. I would look for maybe others in your field um, or, you know, someone who is your supervisor. Like you said, you hired some supervisors. They're very supportive because they know exactly what you're going through or exactly what you're seeing and they can help you process it a little bit better. Yeah, definitely. Um, we're running out of time here, but a few more questions. Um, so how has, you told us a little bit about COVID changing your field, but how has it changed with regard to, I know you said you do the um, telehealth. I know back in the day, back when I first started, that was like a taboo thing. No one wanted to talk about it. No one wanted to touch it. And now it was like overnight when COVID happened, therapists were forced into it. So how do you feel about it? Um, um, I don't mind it. I remember when this first happened, I was like, oh, okay, we'll be virtual for like a month or two and then we'll be back in the office. <laughs> um, and now it's been a year. So it's grown on me. I definitely feel like I preferred seeing clients in person and face to face, but I still think telehealth is just as helpful. Mm -hmm. And if anything, it's allowing clients to be more flexible they're able to, you know, meet in the comfort of their home and feel comfortable, or if they're busy or running an errand or something, they can pause and just talk to me in their car, or whatever the case may be. Um, so I think it has a lot of pros, and I think it's been pretty helpful. I like that you said earlier that it's causing clients not to cancel as much, and yes. I noticed that, you know, when people did therapy face-to-face -face. something about a client coming to an office I don't know if that triggers anxiety for them or makes them feel you know like they un feel uncomfortable almost but 
the telehealth, it's like, okay, I can do this at home. I can do this on my lunch break. You know, mm -hmm. I feel more comfortable on my couch at home talking, you know, so it makes it a little easier for people. Yeah, definitely. Wow. Yeah. I'm so happy that that's an option because I can't remember. I graduated with my master's in social work back in 2006. And when we tried to talk about it in class, everybody was like, no, that's violation of confidentiality. How do you know that having therapy over the internet is safe and that nobody can hack into, you know, mm -hmm. your conversation or over the phone? How do you know that no one's not listening? It was like, they didn't even want to exchange a conversation about it. It was like, no, we're not doing it. It's not okay. going to happen. Let's not even think about it, you know, and now it's happening. So I just find that so unique that, you know, that that's an option when no one wanted to touch it back in the day. Right. Um, um, has confidentiality changed? Like the rules around confidentiality and doing telehealth, has that changed? Like, do you have to have a certain um, type of security when you're talking to people over the internet? Well, you have to make sure that it's HIPAA compliant. So okay. you don't just like regular Zoom. We don't speak on regular Zoom. My practice that I work for has like a specific, like a licensed Zoom. So the Zoom is protected. Zoom's like protected. Um, or we may use Google Meet, but we're in a G suite, so that's protected. Um, certain therapy or um, like electronic health record platforms like Simple Practice or Therapy Notes, like they have, you can do telehealth through them as well. And those are HIPAA compliant. Okay. Um, so that's been how we've been able to, to do that. Okay. Wow. That's good. I've always wondered about that. Um, so I think we've went through all of the questions. Do you have any other things you'd like to add for our viewers for support or for advice or just any tips that you want to share? Final thoughts? Um, I think final thoughts, again, I will always go back to it, just taking care of yourself and prioritizing yourself, reaching out to mentors, reaching out to people who can help, maybe looking up therapists in your area and just starting to talk to them about their journey or their process because everyone's is different mm -hmm. and maybe doing research on just like the different types of therapists that you can be because there's so many avenues that you can take you can be a psychologist or you can go to med school and be a psychiatrist or you can be a licensed professional counselor or you can be specific in marriage and family therapy or social work like there's so many different options mm -hmm. so just seeing what route makes the best sense for you yeah, I think, you know, knowing the options is extremely important. I wish I had known all the different options um, when I first started because every process for licensing is different. Also, the training you get is different. The classes you take are different. Um, the clients you see may be different. So yes, if I had been able to talk to at least one person from each one of those fields, then I probably would have made a better decision about what would have been best for me at yeah. the time, but I didn't have that information. So yes, great advice, Jordan. Um, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. And the last question is for me, what are some resources the library offers people who are new to the job market? Maybe you're changing careers or looking for new work. Um, maybe this could be a result of COVID-19 or something else. You can visit us on our website at pgcmls.info. You can visit our online library. You can go to the jobs and careers section, and there you will see BrainFuse and the Learning Express Library. On those platforms, you can do career assessments. You can search for jobs, create resumes, get expert feedback from a live job coach, um, which is completely free. You can also find veterans resources there if you are a vet um, and you can prepare for college if you're a high school student, maybe you wanna brush up on your job skills because you're looking to change careers. You can do that and so much more. Visit us 24 hours a day at pgcmls.info. Use your library card number and your four digit passcode to get in. If you are a student in PG County, you can use your student ID card. That is your library card number. And with that number, you can log in 
and use the last four digits of that number as your pin. And you can also have access to these wonderful, great digital resources. Um, Jordan, thanks again for joining us. We Thank enjoyed you. you. Um, great conversation. Good luck with the rest of your career. Um, I'm pretty sure our viewers enjoyed hearing from you today. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Have a good one. <laughs> yes. And viewers, join us again next Wednesday as we explore a new and exciting career at 3 p.m. Again, I'm Shannon Crooks, Librarian 3 at the Hillcrest Heights branch. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time. Have a right. great week and stay safe. Thanks. Bye.